Good morning, Mark out of HurricaneTrack.com here with your Hurricane Matthew update for Monday morning, October 3rd, 2016. First, let's take a look at the latest track map from the National Hurricane Center. Most of the activity of the severe nature is going to be on the right side of this hurricane. Probably the core and the strongest winds will be to the east of Jamaica. For folks that canceled plans to go down there, you did the right thing because you just never know. And do you really want to be down there? Had this jogged 150 miles more to the west. And uh, I know it stinks to not get to go on your vacation, but look at it this way. Beautiful Jamaica will be pretty much intact for you to enjoy another time. I can't say the same for the Haitian Peninsula here, and uh, parts of the Bahamas are going to be hit hard. And so what is good for Jamaica is very bad, especially for Haiti and probably southeast Cuba. And then looking bad again here in the Bahamas, unfortunately, another strong hurricane here. You know, it was just a year ago that Hurricane Joaquin devastated the Bahamas uh, region uh, right in here, actually. So this is, what can you say? It's very unlucky and very unfortunate because the obvious impact to people, but you know, the economy gets disrupted after the fact. People don't get to visit. It's just unpleasant all around. Like I say, they look fantastic. From satellite perspective, we can awe at their beauty, but when they interact with land, it's not exciting and fun anymore in terms of the, uh, the spectacle that nature puts on, and I mean that very seriously. So that being said, check it out. I mean, it is an incredible piece of energy here, very uh, well-defined. I think the cloud tops, they look like they're getting colder right in here as well as more organized. You see that? Uh, just notice how there's a lot more oranges in here and then the larger central dense overcast here with the red I don't know this might be getting ready to go through another strengthening phase and the eye may be starting to get a little bit larger right in here it's hard to tell uh, but look at those very cold cloud tops right there those grays indicating uh, temperatures of minus 70 to minus 80 degrees way up pressing up against the bottom of the stratosphere so very impressive upward motion. That's what the convection is that we talk about. So here's Jamaica, and there will certainly be some rainfall pinwheeling through, uh, but the storm surge and the, the most horrific of the impacts, and I mean that very seriously here, you know, when people say, don't hype it up, you got to hype it up for here because there's people in harm's way, and there will be unfortunate loss of life there. Uh, again, luckily for Jamaica, this will pass well well enough to your east that it won't be as bad nearly for that area. So let's take a look at the overnight runs of the different models because there was a big shift, a lot of talk about it out on social media, etc. And so these are the different uh, looks at the way the models are with densities using gradients and colors and all kinds of ways to visualize this stuff uh, this day and age. And this is the GFS, it's referred to as the AVN operational. It used to be called the AVN model and the INSEP global model, and now it's just the, G, uh, the GFS, global forecast system. All right, so this line is the operational. That's the run that I show you with all the layers and everything. And that run comes right up here, and there it is there. That's the operational run from 0Z last night. What does that mean? That means the model was initialized at zero UTC or Zulu time, or roughly 8 p.m. Eastern time. The GFS has four different runs throughout the day. Zero Z, 6 Z, 12 Z, and 18 Z. Or it's initialized at 8 p.m., 2 a.m., 8 a.m., and 2 p.m. And then the runs come out, render out on the web, etc., several hours later. And we get to view them and stew over what they show, all right? So that's the operational run. Then the GFS has all these different members of the operational called ensemble members. That's what all these little white lines are. I've said it before, think of it as the operational is the conductor of the orchestra. I think that's the best way to look at it. And all the ensemble members are the rest of the orchestra, the orchestra itself perhaps. And when you put them together 
in a perfect world, it would you know make beautiful music, right? That's the idea. So the ensemble forecast system in the close range down here, the analogy is in a perfect world, it should be nice and tight, like an orchestra should be. Everything's tight, and you get a beautiful product. Well, in the short range, that's generally what we see. There's not much spread. We don't have models taken off like this early and like that and like that. So this is good right through here, the first four to five days. And after that, you start seeing this pretty tremendous spread in the GFS ensembles. Some of them over eastern North Carolina and up into the mid-Atlantic in New England. And a majority of them pretty far offshore, indicated by the yellow denser area. You know, we can talk about statistics and what all this means, but to the layperson, you want to know where it's going to go. And these gradients kind of help to see that. You visualize that, that the denser model tracks are going to show up in the reds and with more confidence and a higher percentage of happening, etc. And the less confident areas are going to be yellows and blues and so forth and so on. So this is what the GFS showed from the overnight run the zero Z. The operational was only about 10 to 15 miles with the eye, the eye of the hurricane, right off of Cape Hatteras, and then it moved off to the north from there, clipping just east of Cape Cod, with a landfall technically up here in Bar Harbor, Maine, roughly, something like that. So that's what the GFS shows. There's another good model out there, the United Kingdom Met Office, the UK Met for short. This is its operational run. It comes up through, uh, very similar, by the way, what the GFS shows through this time period here. GFS maybe a little further west. And then uh, at the end game, the UK Met only goes out, eh, I think it's about six days, uh, making landfall over Cape Lookout. So the GFS, let me draw in, uh, was here, roughly, and the UK Met has a landfall over here uh, at around the same time, roughly speaking. And uh, so, you know, you have to look at that and say, that's interesting, certainly. Then we have the very revered and much talked about Euro, the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. It has an operational model, the red one. Uh, this is the official forecast track from the Hurricane Center superimposed on this right there. And then you have all of its ensemble members. It has 51. The GFS is 20. This has 51. I want to point out a few things here. Look at these tracks way over into the Gulf of Mexico. Now, before you go worrying about Panama City Beach, etc., that's just one of 51 members of the European Ensemble. Uh, yeah, there's quite a few. Look at this, the density right through here, closer to Andros Island in southeast Florida, and then a little bit more of a density up here off of Charleston and south of Wilmington. But ultimately, the operational comes up and turns it hard right and then kind of mills around, waiting for more trough energy to come by. And then eventually it would probably just send it on out to sea, in my opinion, if that were to verify. This is also way out in the future. Each of these time points here, there's 168 hours and this is 240 hours. That's 10 days. To think that this would be still sitting out here in 10 days makes me weak in the knees. I don't want to, ugh, that would just, <laughs> please don't let that happen. You know, either get out, we don't want it to make landfall, you know, from a impact perspective. Scientifically, yeah, it'd be neat to go study it. I mean, this is what I do, but I don't want damage and death and destruction to people. So either get out or, I don't know, if you're going to make landfall somewhere, make it very brief, right, and get out. But sitting there for 10 days, no way. That just, oh, I can't even imagine. But back on task here, uh, you see the problem. You know, that's a pretty far west track for the Euro. And I think it's the westernmost of all of the different models there. If we go back and the GFS doesn't get that far west, it's like over here the Euro is. Uh, the UK Met wasn't that far west either. And then there it is uh, with the Euro. So... I think what changed, they put something like 22 different drops on data pieces into the Zero Z models. Uh, the NOAA plane, the jet, uh, flew out, I believe it was out in here. I'd have to go look and see. But 
basically it's more data to go into the model because there's no weather balloons being launched to speak of of any density over the ocean, obviously. Maybe some of these Caribbean islands, I don't know which ones actually launch sounding balloons twice a day or maybe even once a day. Uh, so the jet goes out and adds more data points. And so you see what happens. Now everything shifted west. Was that a, a result of that? I mean, is it believable? Well, I don't know. We, you know that's, other scientists have to figure that out. But you can see this is definitely a threat to the southeast United States after this gets out of the Caribbean. Now, the 6Z run of the GFS, I just want to show you this. Um, I'm going to run it for you here. There's Matthew down there. And here's our ridge of high pressure. A little piece of trough energy left over. Just watch what happens here. It's fairly fast. Comes up through Haiti, threads the windward passage there into the southeast and central Bahamas, coming on up to the northwest Bahamas. And you see that ridge poking in every time, expanding, expanding, expanding. And then right there at day five, we'll do it one more time, just shy of making the Carolina coastline. And once it gets to the end, I'm going to just point out a couple of things to look for. Uh, going down the road. So here we are. First of all, let's go out to 96 hours and see where this is located. So 96 hours, we got this ridge building over the top of it and some ridging out here over the Atlantic and a little bit of a reflection, some energy trying to erode that ridge a little bit uh, to the well to the northeast of Matthew. All of these different things are going to matter. And so when we get to the last frame at day five, uh, you notice this trough is pretty strong and the ridge kind of start, starting to give way a little bit. Five days out, this is coming up on Saturday, you know, it's just a matter of the timing and the placement. Uh, you know, if the ridge is just a little stronger back here, then this can come on up into eastern North Carolina. If it's a lot stronger and Matthew is a lot slower, then yeah, this could turn into Florida before turning northeast. It's not over yet, folks, not by a long shot. And I want to caution you that even if this misses a, a landfall in the United States, the fact that it'll be riding up this 29 degrees Celsius water through here, uh, surrounded by 28 degrees Celsius, that's 82, 83, 84 degrees, this is going to send tremendous wave energy into the southeast and Florida and eventually up here to the south-facing beaches of New England. And that alone will cause tremendous beach erosion uh, for days. So that's the first impact that we've got. And then from there, we're going to have to just keep waiting. I know it stinks to high heaven, and it's painful because people need to make decisions. I know I do. I have a lot of equipment that I could take out into something like this and provide incredible information. And, you know, I need to know when do I need to leave, where do I need to go. But that doesn't matter. I mean, what matters is you guys, that this would affect. And we just don't know. I wish we did. Believe me. Uh, so what can I say? We're going to have to keep waiting maybe another 48 hours. It's possible. All right, so the uh, interaction on YouTube, uh, unbelievable. I really appreciate it. It's awesome. Keep the comments coming. I'll try to answer what I can. And, uh, of course, follow on Twitter. At Hurricane Track, I post uh, tidbits of information there from time to time. And then, yep, we do have an app, uh, a lot of interaction in the app from people sending emails. The latest version of the app uh, on iOS has this little message that pops up from time to time, and I'm able to change that message myself. It's kind of like a push notification, but it pops up you know, every certain amount of times that you open the app from start. And in that message, it has, uh, from uh, time to time, my email address. Hey, if you want me to address something, send me an email. And it's been nice to see people responding to that. You know, this interaction is very important. But yes, we do have an app, iOS and Android. And um, hopefully the iOS is going to get an uh, update here soon that will feature live video. Once that comes, I will let you know. But it's available in the App Store and on Google Play. And anything I do Hurricane Track related goes into the app. So you can take it on the go, especially these videos. We have a video section, and they, you just pull down to refresh, and there they are. So if you're away from your computer and you can't watch on YouTube, you can check the app. It goes to that instantly. All right?
Well, that's it for the morning. I'll have at least one more video today and probably two. And um, this is a great way to communicate with you, to show you what I'm thinking, what I see, and uh, we'll go from there. If this is going to hit the United States, I will say this. I will have the most incredible setup that you've ever seen. And I don't want to sound too you know, bold about it, but those who know and have seen the progress that we have made with our remotely operated camera systems, I put it out during Hurricane Hermine, uh, Cedar Key, Florida was an unbelievable example of it. It was incredible. And just imagine there are many, many more of those cameras where that came from. And weather stations to provide high resolution data. Uh, we're not talking about home weather stations either. Nothing against those, but these are the big boys that they put on the NOAA hurricane buoys and on the storm chase vehicles in Tornado Alley. They can withstand winds of over 200 miles per hour and they give us data every minute. That's going to be remarkable if it's needed. A little early, but you know, I just wanted to kind of tease you with that, that if this hits land, all of this goes on the road, and uh, I'll show you what happens with this hurricane like you've never seen it before. So we'll wait and see if that point comes. It might not, but if it does, you can bet that uh, my team and I will be on it. All right. Again, that's it for this morning. I'm Mark Suddeth, HurricaneTrack.com. Thanks for tuning in, as always. I'll be back with you again with another update this afternoon.